Okay, I'd like to start this session by introducing Louise Lawson, the Conservation Manager for Sculpture and Time-Based Media at Tate. Louise. Thank you. Um, this presentation is actually going to focus on the ethical considerations, deliberations that arose when installing a 49-piece neon installation. There it is. Um, and this is a work by the American artist Jason Rhodes. Um, I'll be talking through generally the thought process and then looking at this specifically in relation to ethics. And although I am focused on a specific artwork, I'm hoping it will kind of draw out broader questions. So when this work was initially selected for display, it was the first time since it was acquired that it was actually going to be installed. So two parallel, parallel dialogues actually started, one with the artist's estate and the second with specialists in neon technology. So what are neons? I'm going to explain it very basically. Um, neons are basically electrified glass tubes pumped with gas and coated on the inside to create bright colours. Um, and in this instance, the neon was attached to a transformer via an electrode, which is covered with a cap, attached to a plug. This is a power strip, which is part of the artwork. Goes to the UK Power Mains. So the neon specialist basically said to us that this work didn't actually meet UK electrical regs um, in the fact that this wasn't suitable, the plug wasn't suitable, the transformer wasn't suitable, and this cap would probably melt. Um, so at the same time, he said to the artist's estate, can you tell us what's significant to the piece? They said, well, we want it to light. However, um, we purposely selected the power strip, the plug, the transformer, and this little cap because it has real sculptural value. Great. So it started to become transparent that the UK legislation was going to have a direct impact to this artwork <coughs> if we followed through to make it operational, i.e. plug it in without killing everybody. Um, and we knew that at that point it was probably going to require some level of intervention through the introduction of new components or the modification of the existing components. So what on earth do you do? Well, you start to ask yourself a range of questions, the who, why, what, why, why me? Um, and you kind of hope that scrutinising the information that you have, looking for the information that you need, that you'll be able to make an appropriate and good decision. But who makes the judgment and who defines what's acceptable for that strategy going forward? This was actually a collaborative process between all of these people. And it became a very active choice in managing the interventions with this artwork. So in the role of ethics, it actually becomes quite challenging. And I am going to be the person who puts up some ethical statements. Someone has to, and it's me. And for the purpose of debate, I've purposely picked these ones. So looking at Europe, responsible to the owner. Well, Tate owns the work, but the artist created the work. And how should we involve artists, artist estates, studios, in conservation decisions and installations? I liked significance of aesthetic, historical, spiritual, physical. Well, I think we could say we're there for the spiritual significance of this artwork. But if you're going to change, remove components, then it starts to get a little bit more tricky. Indispensable for its preservation. Well, it's not so much about its preservation, but to make it operational, it's about its <coughs> access, um, the artistic integrity. Um, interfering. Well, we might interfere... Maybe that can be seen as a restoration strategy, not so much focused on the structural integrity, but the electrical integrity of the piece. Um, and then I thought, well, what's America saying? This concerned me. Rem do not remove or obscure original material. Oh, that's, that's difficult. Um, but then I went back to the UKIC ethics, and I liked it because they actually qualified this statement by saying, unless for, un do not modify characteristics unless for clearly defined reasons clearly defined reasons. We had clearly defined reasons, and I like that statement. So, outcomes. <laughs> this was it. Before we acquired it, when it was installed previously, this is when we installed it. And I think, basically, what happened with this is there was a conflict or perhaps an internal dilemma as a conservator when you're trying to consider the historic context, the artist's intent, impact of legislation, or perhaps changing legislation. You know, maybe when you acquire something like this in the 70s, and then you come to display it, 2012, legislation's changed. Um, along with current installation requirements, display, location, budget, scheduling constraints, and it asks the question, what should the influence of the artist be? Technical specialists, curators in artworks, and how does that change when you're managing change in an artwork? And what's the role of the conservator in all of that? 
and it kind of led me to ask the questions, should key principles be established in ethical codes to enable conservators to source and introduce n- new components in a justified and managed way? And to me, ask the question whether the ethical codes are relevant or even applicable in contemporary art. I thought maybe they are linked to restoration, reconstruction, but I'm going to ask you, what do you think? Thank you. Thank you very much, Louise. Please be nice. <laughs> <laughs> I can't guarantee that, I'm afraid. Okay, fine. Um, I'd like to ask Eugene to respond to that. Yeah, Eugene from uh, University of Birmingham. Um, we know that all matter tends to disorder. They obey the second law of thermodynamics. They lose information over time. Yeah. So um, I'm, I'm interested in your abstract. Um, one statement is that problems can occur when the work is modified over time, with original material being obscured or removed and new material added. Yeah. And I'm, I'm interested in your views on using technology to, co- to capture um, in time the state, uh, you know, the visual state of the object, such as laser scanning. Um, you know, because one day everything will be replaced in time if you yeah. conserve it. So, what is your view towards technological um, preservation methods? Um, let me think. That's not a nice question. No. Um, no, I probably agree that I think technology will play a role. Um, within, the, if I put my other hat on in terms of the time-based media aspect, you know, obviously we're dealing with obsolescent technologies and things are moving forward and we're trying to capture information either by migrating it or emulating it or changing it in some way. And I think the neon, because it kind of splits between sculptural and time-based media, kind of falls in between that. Um, We are taking initially a very traditional approach in the fact that we did change the transformers, but we removed them wholesale. And at the moment, 49 transformers are currently in our archive um, until we work out a better method um, of kind of reusing those, perhaps, because we did explore new technology of a smaller transformer going inside the original casing, but the technology hasn't advanced enough to make them small enough but it is something that we're aiming for and we have documented that because, to me, that's the most satisfactory approach that we can do with that little bit of mm-hmm. the artwork. OK, Eugene. Uh, responses from the floor. Is, uh, one there, David. David Lee, South Wales. Um, picking up on Eugene's point, uh, this really applies to quite a few of the papers we've heard where, mm-hmm. where change... Change is applied to objects. So new parts are brought in, replacement parts. Mm-hmm. We've, we've expressed concern or not about grad, the gradual change of objects. Um, but I think that, that this is happening, and it has to happen, and if health and safety says it's got to happen, yeah. maybe it's got to happen. But isn't our defence getting stronger as, as we improve documentation? Mm-hmm. Uh, and as we was, I was discussing over, over coffee and really, then the question is, how good is our documentation? How good are we re- retaining the documentation of what we have done? We know it mm-hmm. hasn't been good in the past, but can we get it right now to support our shifting ethical approach to replacement? Yeah, I mean, I think documentation is absolutely um, critical. Um, I th- you know, with the documentation, with the, the coach, having that 250-year kind of history, as it were, um, is really important. I think this is going to be um, no different, and I think it's why I raised the question whether we should, in our ethical codes, look at how we justify and manage changing artworks, because I think everybody so far has kind of said it, but not really said it, and I'm devastated that I'm I'm on film actually saying it. (laughs) Thank you, Louise. Any other responses from the floor? Sorry. Go to Andy here first, and then up to the back here. Uh, <coughs> a couple of points in terms of the, uh, the, 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 the oh sorry yeah <laughs> I'm the man who no, needs no introduction <laughs> Andy Calver Heritage Conservation Solutions uh, in terms of what the Tate has done I'm sure you are the Tate has actually laser scanned some of its sculptures and things to, to preserve their form because they are falling apart and modern mm-hmm. materials and things in terms of what I might have done, in terms of this, with it, my experience in other fields is I would have started off by looking for a dif- different, more pragmatic electrician because <laughs> there are generally ways around most legislation if you try <laughs> hard enough. 
I mean, mm -hmm. I think the difficulty in this instance, because um, recently I've had to work on about four um, different neons, is the actual visibility of these electrical components, because we did try to look to see whether we could not operate them as electrical components and kind of hide it um, in some way. Um, but the way in which it's installed made that really problematic. I mean, at the moment, I'm dealing with a neon. has very similar issues apart from the transformers um, don't have to be visible, and so we're deciding not to run them off the original transformers because they're just going to wear through okay. and doing something that's more digital because you don't see it. And I think it varies. I purposely picked this because it's so complicated, and you could have a variety of okay. solutions. Thanks, Louise. We have a, a response from the back here. Um, Hazel Newey, X Science Museum. Um, I probably think about this on two fronts because we had contemporary art um, in the Science Museum. And it made me think that maybe where you've got um, equipment machinery that's going to become obsolete, that maybe the artwork will just gradually disappear or you'll produce a replica. Mm -hmm. And we've said this already this morning, and maybe we conservators or conservation, mm -hmm. museum profession needs to think much more pragmatically or much more sensibly about this and whether or not it is acceptable. Because a lot of this is talking about value, financial value of something as well as cultural value. Mm -hmm. um, the second thing is about electrical equipment. We are often asked if um, either artists or scientists could use some of our old equipment, uh, microscopes, for which you needed lighting. And we ended up actually having to rewire some of our lights. Oh, <gasps> shock, gasp, horror. Isn't that awful? No, it isn't. You know, what, what is a problem sometimes about rewiring things, provided, especially with more contemporary pieces of equipment? Because if you want to use them, they want to be functional. It's exactly the same thing as we discussed earlier this morning. What's the most important thing about that object? The fact you've got the original wires on it, which now don't meet contemporary health and safety um, regulations, or you've got a working object that someone can actually use, enjoy, and mm -hmm. understand. So, mm -hmm. thank you. But this brings us into the field of artistic intent and yeah. the, 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 the desires of the artist, doesn't it? It does. Um, and I think it can be um, quite... Well, in some ways, you could justify it by saying the artist would like to have, um, or the artist insists that we change this or, or do this, but um, everybody changes their mind. You know, the artist in 20 years' time could have a different viewpoint and reflect back very differently. So I think that's where the role of the conservator actually becomes quite crucial in kind of managing not only those expectations, but the general sort of direction that the artwork's going to take. And I think it plays very heavily um, on the conservator's mind in terms of being able to make decisions and then the ramifications of those decisions. Just one, more. one at the back here. Sorry, right on the other side. Sorry. <laughs> Sarah Paul Cummel. Um, it's just when you made your point back then, you said about rewiring. My immediate thought then was cost, <laughs> and it's about I suppose justifying the cost and giving these resources into these objects. It's <laughs> how you justify that, and it's all about. I suppose the values then that you assign to it. And I mean, I suppose it's making the case then for if it, is there going to be a huge investment to display mm -hmm. this object and for how long are you going to display it and how long is that investment mm -hmm. going to last, really? Um, well, an investment was made um, because we discussed with the curator when they selected this for display and the neon specialist came in and we had a discussion about, you know, how could we potentially move forward with all of these issues that um, the artist estate had kind of raised. Um, and at that point, a budget was put forward. We discussed it with the curatorial team and said, you know, are you prepared to take this on? And there may be further costs. Um, and they said, no, it's really integral to what we're trying to say. We really want to have a really large neon piece in Liverpool. So the decision was taken mm -hmm. that... Yeah, we would invest that. Okay, thanks, Louise. We're going to need to move on. Thank you very much.